Welcome to QX Church. I'm Pastor Scott Conway. Uh, one of the praises we have going on is also going to affect the, the recording today. Uh, and you can probably hear it right now. We have construction going on. So we have had a, a blown out storefront since July. And we have had a group of men really working hard to make sure that this can all be done coming into the Christmas holiday. That if things went on the conventional schedule, we wouldn't have the supplies here yet. We had a group of guys go uh, up north to go physically pick them up themselves and bring everything down here. We've got a, a group of men who are busy working on this today around other projects and will be coming back all week to try to get this done. The blessing for them, this is going to give them some money for the holidays. The blessing for us is we are going to have our place rebuilt. So... The, the challenge is if we didn't get this rushed in, so this is part of why the interference, it could have easily been pushed off into next year sometime. Because one of the problems we run into is getting the supplies down could have taken a couple of weeks, and then you have to wait for decent weather to work. And we are in December, and then January and February rolling around, and so if we have a spat of bad weather, then their entire work list gets pushed back. So we really appreciate the blessing of them showing up on a Sunday to work. They've been at it for a while now already. And so there will be that kind of sound going on behind us as we go. So uh, bear with us and uh, you know, just enjoy the fact all this background noise means that there's blessings all around. Today's topic is our Christmas relationship with God. And talking about our Christmas relationship with God, of course, you know, mentioning that, uh, you know, it is Christmas time. And Christmas time is typically one of the two times people show up for church. If they only go to church once a year, you'll typically see them at church on Easter Sunday. The beauty, of course, of Easter Sunday is it is a Sunday. And so people know, all right, you know, I only go to church maybe once a year. Sunday's going to be the day and Easter is going to be the, the religious holiday to do it for them. But if they go to church twice, the second one's usually sometime around Christmas. At least they're going for Christmas. They might be going to a Christmas Eve service, a Christmas Day service, or at least a Christmas themed service sometime around the Christmas holiday. These are the two times even very nominal Christians tend to prioritize attending church at least once. And because of that, that affects typically how God is presented to them. That at Christmas, of course, we're talking about the baby Jesus. At Christmas, we're talking about the manger. At Christmas, we're talking about Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, and the wise men coming in from the east. We're, we're talking about the birth of Jesus Christ, the baby Jesus. And that's very commonly people come to church only around Christmas if they're exposed to the Christmas specials, the Christmas story, and that's the story they hear. That tends to be their first perception of God. Likewise, when people are connecting to God just at Easter time, it's the resurrected Lord. It's the adult Jesus going to the cross, paying the price for our sins of being resurrected in triumph and ascending to heaven. And then that becomes the key presentation they're constantly exposed to about Jesus. So we're going to be talking a bit today about Jesus, about God, and about how we relate to him, how we relate to him at this time of year, how we relate to him in general. So as we come into Christmas, one of the things is we're talking about baby Jesus, adult Jesus, Jesus being born into this world, and then Jesus dying. The two key Christian holidays that even nominal Christians go out of their way, most often out of their way, to take in a church service, to take in some fellowship, to take in some kind of a, a Christian presentation of some form, some portion of the gospel message. One of the things sometimes that we forget is Christmas, this fabulous holiday that I love so much. I love the lights, I love the trees, I love the presents, I love so much about this season. The purpose of Christmas is Easter. Christmas happened. So, Easter could happen. Jesus coming into the world as a baby was to make Easter even possible. If it wasn't for Christmas, there could be no Easter. If there was no Easter, there would be no Christianity, no salvation, no 
lordship of Jesus Christ, no saviorship of Jesus Christ, no ability to be forgiven for your sins through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, because there would have been no Jesus Christ to die on the cross for my sins. And the world would have continued going as it was. Easter was to give us the offer of salvation so we could have this family relationship to God. So we'd be given the spirit of adoption as children of God. So that we could have this relationship with God on an eternal basis because heaven is God's home. Heaven is where God's family gets invited to God's home. And Easter was to give that to us. Christmas was the path to that. By accepting Christ as Savior, we are born again into God's family, and we get to celebrate with the family of God. And the family of God being able to be with our Heavenly Father is a lot like the ultimate ideal Christmas. The family getting together in adoration. The family getting together with all things forgiven, all the bad stuff gone. Imagine all the best parts of getting together with the people you like the most, all preserved for eternity. And all those kind of awkward, annoying, difficult, oh my gosh, do we have to do this again parts, those are gone. That would be a pretty awesome gathering. And then by growing in our acceptance of Christ as Lord, and we talk about accepting Christ is Lord, that He is Lord, is one major step. But as my Lord, that tends to be a progression. That tends to be a kind of a bit by bit, more and more submitting myself to walking in a Christ-like way, submitting myself to godliness, submitting myself to being more spiritual, submitting myself to love, submitting myself to joy, submitting myself to peace. And that's a progression for most people. It's not, boom, it's that done, perfect. Our growing in our acceptance of Jesus Christ as Lord as we grow to maturity as a member of God's family, helps us live the spiritual life and have more and more of it right here, right now. And the, one of the beautiful things about Christmas and the spirit of Christmas is that's when the Christian world, even the nominally Christian world, seems to catch that spirit the best. During the season when we celebrate with the lights and the trees and all the other stuff, that, that tends to be when we as a society tend to do it about the best we do it, which is pretty cool, I think. Now, are there negative aspects of it too? Of course there are. But if you look at the positive ones, we do all right in the areas where we step it up. Now, if we could do all of the areas stepping it up, and we could do it all the time, I think that'd be pretty great. When Jesus was born, the Magi knew he was a king, he was a priest, and he was one to die. King, priest, one to die. Now, how do we guess that they knew? The wise men knew who Jesus was when he was born. They went out of their way to come out of the east. Now you have the, the stories of the three kings, and you have just the wise men. You have some people think there were three, some people think there were more than three. Based upon historical evidence, it would appear that these were the Persian Magi. That they were the descendants of the, the Chaldeans, the, the stargazers, the astrologers, the dream interpreters, the mystics, coming out of the east. When they showed up to come find this baby, they saw his star in the sky. And whatever that meant to them, it was important enough for these Persians, who were enemies of the Romans, to launch this massive expedition to leave Persian territory and go into Roman territory. Dangerous enough as it is. And as they came out, they okay, it's somewhere around here, somewhere in the Jerusalem area, and they go to Herod, appointed king of the Jews to tell him we have come seeking the one born king of the Jews. Pretty bold, audacious statement there. They knew they were coming and looking for the king. And when they came, they brought a gift of gold. 
the gift of gold is a gift for a king. That one of the protocols is when you were coming to honor a king, you're coming to honor the heir to the throne, you would bring a gift of gold. And the gift of gold was to honor the kingship, the, the royalty of this newborn babe. But if you were going to go visit for a priest, the gift for a priest is frankincense. And so when they brought the gift of gold, this was the gift for the king. When they brought a gift of frankincense, that was a gift for a priest. What was the third one? Myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Well, what is myrrh? Myrrh is a spice. Specifically, it is a burial spice. Myrrh is a gift that you bring to signify someone to be buried with honor. Someone who is here to die. Someone whose time is up. And when they brought the myrrh, it's a gift to signify that this newborn babe was here with a mission to die. King, priest, and the one to die. Now, to whatever extent Mary and Joseph understood what these gifts were, and there's, there's some evidence that they had, a, they had an idea what was up. They had a sense that th this is a whole different deal here. And that they were going to be part of this pivotal event. And that there was something going on. And that was already being revealed in Mary's relationship with Elizabeth. That was already being revealed with the angel appearing to both Mary and separately to Joseph. Something was up. And if they understood this, they already knew some of what was going on here. Now a curious thing about um, Joseph is Joseph was a legal heir to the throne of Israel. That his genealogy goes back to the kings. One of the problems is, is Joseph's lineage was, weren't always good people. In fact, they were pretty bad kings. They were such bad kings that at one point God put a blood curse on his lineage. Now here got to be the funny thing. Prophecy said that the coming Messiah was going to have to be the legal heir to the throne, a son of David, a descendant of King David. Well, now there's a problem. There's a blood curse on the royal line of David. Now what do you do? Well, it turns out that Mary is also blood descended through David outside the lineage of kings through a different son than Solomon. So, God got around the blood curse in a very ninja-like, cool fashion. All right, we get the blood of David through Mary. We get the legal lineage of David through Joseph. He's legally the son of Joseph, but not the blood son of Joseph. He's the blood son of Mary, who has the blood of David in her lineage. And Jesus is born. Now, historically... Ever since the founding of the kingships in Israel and in Judah after the split of the kingdoms, the offices of king and priest had always been separate. In fact, they had always been so separate that when King Saul stepped up and he made a sacrifice, which was part of the office of the priesthood, that cost him the throne. That he crossed the line from king to priest. The kings were the kings. Their job was the government. Their job was the secular side. The priests were the priests. Their job was the religious side. Their job was the religious life of the community. And the kings and the priests were two separate offices. They had always been separate until Jesus. Until these magi show up to the legal heir to the throne that Herod currently sits on, appointed by Rome, and they acknowledge him as both king and priest. And the New Testament tells us that Jesus wasn't descended through the tribe of Levi. He's through the tribe of Judah. But we're told that he is in the office, he is our high priest in the office of Melchizedek. And that's a whole study in and of itself. That one's a pretty cool one to look into as well. So how the Magi related to Jesus is backed up by Scripture. 
He's the one born king of the Jews. He's the legal heir to the throne. He's the king of kings, the lord of lords, the prince of peace. He's our high priest of the order of Melchizedek. Easter is about him dying and returning, and it seems the Magi knew. Now, how could these non-Jew Magi from the Persian East know? They might have known because of Daniel. If you go look at the book of Daniel, you'll see an interesting thing when you begin to consider this. Is First off, Daniel is taking place in what would become the Persian Empire. And if you read the book of Daniel, see this curious thing is he ends up being appointed a very, very high office because he knows what these dreams mean. Because God tells Daniel the interpretation of the dreams that God gives to Nebuchadnezzar. And later on, when literally the handwriting is on the wall with uh, Belteshazzar, or Bel Belshazzar, I might have the pronunciation wrong, but it's a handwriting on the wall episode, and they call in Daniel, and Daniel interprets it, is that's who Daniel was. And Daniel was put in charge of this group of the Magi. And then here, centuries later, the star appears, and this order of mystics, once led by Daniel, who had the prophecy of the 70 weeks, Somehow they know exactly what that means. And they mount their expedition to go know. And if you go read the prophecies of Daniel, and you can break some of those out for those who are interested in those kind of prophecies, is that kind of tells you Daniel knew what was up. And if Daniel left word for his order, and so they're waiting for this event, and they say, hey, that's it. Time to go. Let's go. And they knew. Now, the Bible doesn't just refer to God in one way. It's not like every single time God is mentioned, he's only called one thing every single time. He has lots of different titles, lots of different names, lots of different references and referrals. In fact, if you dig through every mention of God, the Bible references God in more than 750 slightly different ways comfortably more than 50 significantly different ways. But over 750 that are even slightly different. And when you begin to look at all of these ways, you go, huh, why might that be? Well, part of it certainly is that God has this very robust identity. He, he's not easy to just put in a box. And it's been so long since I've talked about this that I misremembered it way too small. Now, if you kind of follow in week by week, you may have heard me mention like 400 or 450 with over 50 major distinct ways. I was way off. I mean, I thought there were more than major 50, or 50 major distinctions, but only about 400, 450 variations. Nope, God gives us way more options than that. And when I went back and I looked at it, because I was thinking, you know, I'm not really sure that was right. Let me, let me go take a look at this number again. 750. Over 750. That's pretty amazing. Now, I am a martial arts master. After 45 more, more than that years training, yeah, I, I should be pretty good at this stuff. So how many right ways are there to deal with a violent situation? Is there just one? One right way? Or might there be more than one right way? Might there be a whole bunch of different ways? And even if we were to nail it down to something so specific, what if I have a single male unarmed attacker on a smooth surface who's stepping forward with his left foot while he's punching with his right hand? What is the one right way to deal with that kind of attack? There isn't one right way. There's tons of different ways to deal with that kind of attack. Okay, what if we nail it down? Okay, one single and armed male attacker stepping with his left, punching with his right. No weapons. I have no weapons. I have to stand my ground and fight. I have to do a move. What do I do? Is there one move that's the one right move? Or are there literally hundreds of different ways still to handle a situation like that. 
and my martial arts bias, that, that simple realization that there's a whole bunch of right ways to handle it. Some of it depends what's your, your objective. Why are you standing your ground? How much damage do you want to do? And even if you nail that, okay, suppose I have to have them ultimately laid out, incapacitated, unable to keep on fighting. Now are we down to just one way? No, still a lot of ways to do it. And if I pick one way, this time, in a different way next time, in a different way the time after that, if there's a hundred of us in the room and all hundred of us have slightly different techniques, some of them might be in the general case. So, okay, let, let's even go this far. Let's suppose I want to block that move. What is the one way to block that move that is the one right way to block a punch? There isn't one. I mean, even in broad categories, you get inside the flex and outside the flex and upward blocks and inside blocks and outside blocks. And so many ways to handle it. And even when you narrow it down to a very, very specific situation, you still don't end up with just one right way. And so I had this physical metaphor in my life that I had been immersed in for over 45 years that reminds me that very often there's not just one right answer. That very often there's multiple good answers. And all of them are right if all of them accomplish the objective. Well, God does the same thing for us. He gives us 750 right answers. So if the question is, well, how do you come to God? Of all the truths about God, which one resonates with you most so you can come to Him down that path most easily? God says, here's your menu of options. You have 750 right answers to that question. That's mind-boggling. So of those 750 different ways God has identified in Scripture, which are the correct ways for us to approach God? Answer, all of them. 750 right answers to, well, how, how do I come to God? Well, pick which one works for you. Which one resonates with you? Which one is your easiest path to connect with God? Which one is your easiest path to relate to God? Which one is the, of the 750 separate paths is the one you most need right now? Is the one that will make the biggest difference for you right now? And you can come to God that way. Now consider 750 different individual paths. Now are we mandated to say, well, but you can only pick one. You can only pick one. Or can we pick more than one? Because here's the thing, of these over 750, and we'll, we'll just round it off to 750. We'll round it down to 750. They may also be used in any combination. In any combination of one or more of the paths. If, if you knew God as fully and completely as language will allow, and you literally somehow had all 750 of them in mind at exactly the same moment, that would be a way. But if you had only two of them in mind, any combination, and all of those combinations would also be correct ways to relate to God. So if there are 750 different individual ways, 750 individual right answers, if you were to use any two, that means choice number one could be any of the 750, and then of the 749 remaining, choice number two could be any of the 749. So if you take 750 times 749, that's a total number of possible combinations of 750 variables, as proper ways to relate to God using two of them at a time, that's 561,750 different two-part combinations of ways to relate to God. Over half a million ways. So if I just come to God as my Creator and my Savior, and that's my whole relationship with God, well, there's still 561,749 other combinations 
that people could also use to come to God in any given moment. It's huge. Okay, well, what about three? What about three? Well, if we go up to three, that's 750 times 749 times 748. 420 million 189,000 over 400 million different ways you could combine any three truths about God as you come to Him. That is enough so every man, woman, and child in the United States of America could wake up on Christmas morning and have their own individual choice and they don't have to, any of them, choose the exact same one. That's pretty amazing. And that's only three. When we look at all the correct ways God has given us to come to Him. So when we do all the possible combinations, so now it's 750 times 749 times 748, blah, 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 down to times... 3 times 2 times 1. The number of combinations of ways to reference God is roughly 10 to the 218th power. You're going to round it off to its exponent. 218 zeros. Uh, it, the math works out to something like 5, 922, 386, 521, 532, comma, 855, comma, 700, comma, 15 more zeros, 15 more zeros, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15. I, I'm having to look at my notes account. 15, 15, 15, 15, and after that, 12 more zeros. Now, in case you're wondering, that's a lot! The number of combinations of ways to reference God divided by the number of people currently alive. So if you took the total population of the earth and every single one of them got to, to pick one, so you divided it down, and then everyone on the planet is going to you know, make their choice and, and then we're going to kind of go on from there. So if you divide that up, then we're down to a nine comma eight seven zero comma six four four comma two oh two comma five five four comma seven six zero comma and fifteen more zeros. And fifteen and fifteen 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 and six more zeros after that. What 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 this boils down to is even if everybody who has ever existed approach God a different way every single day. There is no possibility of exhausting all of the ways to approach God before the heat death of the universe. What this means is if all of them were alive from the beginning of humanity to the end of the universe, the universe would suffer its heat death before we did In fact, if every person who's ever existed for the known life of the universe, now we're talking about you know, the, the old earthers, the people who believe that the universe is billions and billions of years old, who believe it will last for billions and billions of more years before the heat death of the universe. And every human being we believe has ever existed, approached God a different way, Every single second of every single day for the existence of the universe. Every day that's ever happened. Every day that will ever happen. There'd still be absolutely no possibility of hitting all those combinations before the heat death of the universe. That's wild. God gives us that many right answers. If someone says, well, how, how do I relate to God? Pick one or two or 500 or 700. And you can have your own all to yourself if you want. And so long as it's from the list, you're okay. I find that 
staggering that God has given us what for all intents and purposes is an infinite list of ways to come to Him. Whatever we need, whatever works for us, whatever connects with us, just start there. Just start there. Now here at QX Church, we have three primary relationships with God. Three primary places that we tend to put our focus. And within these, these general categories, there's a lot of specific ways God is focused on. So we'll just talk about three. Creator, Father, and King. Creator, Father, and King. Now in Creator, we tap into a whole bunch of other ways God is referred to. God is all-knowing. He's really smart. He really knows what's up. And so we call that that God is infinite in his genius. He knows everything. He's surprised by nothing. He gets it. All information to God is, yeah, I know. <laughs> Everything we figure out is, I know, the genius insights of, oh my gosh, I just realized, it's not like, I know, and it's about time too. God is infinite in his genius. God is also infinite in his wisdom. That there's no bad judgment on God's side. God thinks it all through. God doesn't make errors of judgment. God's connected to the infinitely big picture. And partly related to the infinite genius, sometimes when human beings make bad judgment, we made the best call we could on the information that we had. If we had known better, we might have been able to decide better. And that would be a factor of omniscience, the infinite genius, infinite knowledge. But sometimes, even when we know better, we do bad things. Sometimes we don't really think it through. But if we had thought it through, we, we would have realized, oh, yeah. Not that I didn't know, or couldn't have known. It's just that eh, I didn't really kind of think it that far through. God doesn't make those kind of mistakes. He's infinite in his genius, he's infinite in his wisdom, and he's perfect in his love. God does love perfectly. God is bigger than space. Oh, in fact, on, on the love thing. God does love so perfectly, the Bible tells us God is love. And that, that, that there's such this entwined identity of God doing love so perfectly that he is the very embodiment of love. He is the personification of love. And so if you really want to get it down exactly right, do it God's way. Because God is the perfect manifestation of perfect love. God is bigger than space. There's no place you can go in physical space to get someplace God isn't. If you go racing across the universe, you go, ha, finally got away. God can be there, hi. Like, how'd you get here before? Because I was already here. Like, how long have you been here? Forever. <laughs> Why? Because God is also bigger than time. So, omnipresent is God's bigger than space. God is everywhere. All places are here. God is bigger than time. That means to God, all time is now. And God is all powerful. We call that omnipotent. So the infinite genius, infinite wisdom, perfect love, bigger than space, bigger than time. Infinite in the power domain, infinite in the time domain, infinite in the space domain, infinite in the knowledge domain, infinite in the thinking domain, infinite in the insight domain, and a perfect representation of love. That's part of our creator God. 
And now we take all of these aspects to in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And when God created the heavens and the earth, he already knew he was engineering a system to account for entropy, sin, and user error. He already knew he was building a system that was going to have to deal with the breakdown of ordered systems within the universe. He already knew he was going to have to build a system to account for sin. He already knew he was going to have to build a system that could account for user error. So as, as a short example of user error, if I'm kind of moving along and I, I accidentally bang my shin into the edge of the table, that is going to hurt. User error. I just did something to hurt myself. And it's amazing how many things we can physically recover from when we've hurt ourselves. If someone else does an error, and it's their user error, and I got hurt because of their user, it's amazing how many things we can recover from. Now, as with anything, is there sufficient user error that you can literally break a system? Of course there is. But the fact we have this kind of error-correcting system at all is an amazing element of design. And sin. That one's a wild one. Because when you start to think about sin, why do we have sin? We have sin because people make bad choices. Well, why did God even give us the ability to make bad choices? Why did God give us free will at all? Because all we did with free will is decide to not be perfect. We could have been perfect. Well, what kind of relationship can you have with a machine? What kind of relationship can you have with an inanimate object? What kind of relationship can you have with someone or something that you can program to only do exactly what you tell them to do? In order for love to be real, you have to have a choice to not love. In order for obedience to count for anything, the ability to reject obedience has to exist. In order for any kind of connection to be meaningful, the option to not connect has to exist. But here gets to be God's double bind. He had a plan all the way from the beginning that included Christmas and Easter. Now imagine you're one of God's angels and you're kind of sitting around the, the creation council table as God's explaining his plan. He's really excited. I got this cool idea. We're going to make this whole universe. We're going to create man. And I'm going to give man free will. But they're going to have limited awareness. They're not going to know the whole picture. So that way that, that they have choices as they go. And they get to make their decisions based upon best available information. And you go, okay, well, that sounds like a pretty good plan. But um, I'm not quite totally sure. How does this free will thing work? So, like, well, here's going to be the thing. They will have the option to obey me or not obey me. Is it, okay, what if they choose to not obey you? you you're going to, you could lose all of them. So yeah, but he, here's, here's the plan. They will disobey. They will get the sin nature. They, they will have this natural propensity to miss the mark. But that's okay because here's the plan. I'm going to show up as one of them later on so that way I can reach them. And you know, oh. Well, that sounds really interesting, Lord. Tell me more about this plan. This, this, this is beginning to sound pretty cool. Like, and then I'll live as one of them and I'll teach them. Like, oh, oh, you'll be there to teach them in person. Oh, that sounds great. It's like, and then they're going to arrest me, torture me, and kill me. And you go, whoa, 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 wait, hang on a second. All of a sudden, I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm with this plan, but like, God, think about this for a second. They're going to arrest you, torture you, and kill you? Are you sure this is a good plan? Oh, yeah, 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 because... After they kill me, they're going to bury me, and I'm going to come back to life. And so that way, if they will just let me pay the price for their disobedience, I can let them back into the perfection of heaven, and without their sin intact, because I already paid the price for it, they can live with us again. And the angels go, okay, well, you know, the last part sounds pretty good, but you know, that whole arrested, torture, die part in between, I'm, I'm not sure that's a good deal. How about we, we look at another option? It says, there is no other option. Because I want them to have this capacity for love. I want them to, to come be our family in heaven 
with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and for any of these things to even exist and have any meaning at all, they have to have a choice. So, but, 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 but arrested, tortured, died. Why are you paying the price for them to have a choice? Because no one else can. Only perfection can pay the price because only perfection doesn't owe the debt. Has to be me. Has to be me. Now imagine being on that council of angels. Would you sign off on that one? If God gave you the authority? You go, I'm not sure. You know, okay, you're God. Infinite genius, infinite wisdom. I trust that you've thought this through. But you know, from my side, that doesn't look like a good deal for you. He says, well, the rest of the torture died part might not be a good deal for me. All the people who will reject me isn't a good deal with me. Oh, but I love them. And it is such a good deal for them. And God went with that deal. It was going to cost him everything. And he did it anyway. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when he decided to give Adam free will right at the outset, he already knew Christmas and Easter had to be the plan. He had it ready to go right from the get-go. Because God's bigger than time. When God inserts anything anywhere into the equation, God doesn't just see this and say, okay, how could this work out? He already knows how it's going to work out. In time and in eternity. And he has an eye on eternity. So that's our creator. The Bible tells us God is our heavenly father. We also come to God as our Father. He's our Creator, but He's Father. No matter our spiritual age and maturity, our Father loves us. Because we know He is love. He is the very embodiment of love. He does it perfectly. He is love. So whether we're like little kids, newborns, He loves us. When we have no clue, we haven't done a thing, he loves us. When we are immature and we're stepping our feet and we're losing our tempers, he loves us. When we have no clue what we're doing, our father loves us. As we grow up and we begin to learn, we begin to understand, we begin to make choices, he loves us. When we do the right thing, he loves us. When we do the wrong thing, he loves us. Just like a great earthly father, a great earthly mother will love their kids. We might not always be happy with what they're doing in the moment. But we don't come to our kids and say, hey, you got an A- minus on that math test. That's it. Out of the family. I mean, there's a, a joke running around the Asian community because there's this thing called the Asian F, which is anything that's not an A. And the joke is, and it's meant as a joke, but it's meant as a joke with an undercurrent of reality. Just to remind the kids, you, you, you better do your work. And it's the, the, what does an A mean? A is adequate. What's a B mean? Is below adequate. What's a C mean? Can't have dinner. What's a D mean? Don't come home. What's an F mean? Find another family. Now, it's said as a joke, but a lot of people kind of think God's that way. That you have to get it perfect or God's going to be mad at you. Now, God might not like what you did, but God still loves you. And here gets to be the interesting thing with our Heavenly Father. I mean, think about it as an earthly parent. Imagine you have this child that, that you would give your life for. Imagine you have this child you would die for. Imagine you have this child that you would live for. That you would change your life to fulfill your responsibilities for this kid because this kid is so important to you. You won't make the kid the center of your universe and orbit around your kid. 
that you will always prioritize your responsibilities and obligations and your modeling for this child. Which, by the way, precludes making them the center of the universe. And that's what you want for your kid, and your kid messes up. Do you want your kid to run from you, or do you want your kid to run to you? If you knew you were there to help your child, if you knew you were there to comfort your child and be the help, to help your child pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and give it another try, would you want your child to run from you or run to you? Would you want your child to come home with that bad math test and ask for help and you can help? Or would you want them to run and hide because they're afraid that you don't want to be their father anymore because they didn't get a perfect score? Of course we want our kids to come to us. I want my kids to come to me. I want my wife to come to me. If I'm a wife, I want my husband to come to me. If I'm an, an Adult child, I want my parents to know they can come to me. I want my friends to know they can come to me. That's the kind of father God is. But in here, God says, I love you in kindergarten. Let's go to first grade. Sometimes we get upset at ourselves because we're not as mature as we should be. That we're not as knowledgeable as we should be. We don't get as right as we should. And God's whole attitude about it is, look, you're human. There's no shoulds. There's ideals, there's compass headings, there's things to aim for. But you're in first grade. I love you in first grade. Be in first grade. And now let's go on to second grade. Let's just keep getting better. Let's, let's get, learn more stuff. Among many other things, a father wants his children to be ever more good. We don't expect our kids to be perfect right out of the chute and never, ever, ever to make a mistake. We want them to be good and become more good. We want them to be responsible and become more responsible. We want them to be capable and become more capable. And a part of this good, responsible, and capable, that's a manifestation of maturity. That's a manifestation of being an adult. And a father wants his kids to grow up, not just to stay kids. We want our first grader to become a second grader. We want our elementary school kid to become a middle school kid. We want our middle school kid to become a high school kid. We want our high school or adolescent to become an adult. We want our young adult to become a more mature adult. We want them to always be ready to keep moving forward, becoming good, responsible, and capable at higher and higher and higher levels. Now, as part of that, Daddy does not do his children's homework. Daddy may help his children with his homework, but Daddy doesn't do it for the kid. If you're a good parent, your kid is not going to come home from third grade and say, All right, Daddy, here, here's my math homework. I know you know how to do multiple Acadians. Will you do my multiple Acadian homework for me, Daddy? And go, No, you have to do that. But, but you know how to do it. It's just easier if you do it. Would you do your kid's homework? Of course not. Now, would you be willing to sit down and help your kid learn? First off, it's multiplication. It's not multiplication. Maybe we need to work in our English side a little bit, too. Would you help your kid learn multiplication, or would you just do the homework for your kid? And Daddy does not take his children's tests. Now, you know, I, I could ace a third grade test. But I'm not going to show up and say, you know, I'm here to take my kid's math test for him. Now, because uh, you know, if he takes his test, I've been doing his homework for him, and so he doesn't really know this stuff yet, so just, just let me take the test for him. Is that going to be a yes or a no? Is that a good parent or a bad parent? Hey, but your kid's going to get perfect, uh, perfect score, straight A's all the way through, until maybe fifth grade. I don't know, I've seen some of that fifth grade homework. I'm not sure I could ace a fifth grade test sometimes. And, uh, and I literally mean that. We had one time a fifth grader showed up with homework, we had a woman with a college degree, another woman with a master's degree, grappling with this one, going, I don't even know what they're asking for or how to do it. So they brought it to me. Lawyer PhD. And I'm looking at the homework. And sometimes I'm going, I have no idea what they're after in here. 
Someone's going to have to go ask the fifth grade team. They're asking fifth graders to do something. The college graduate, the grad school graduate, and the PhD and looked at it and go, I don't know. I read the instructions. I looked at the prep. I don't know what they're after. You're going to have to go talk to the teacher. That has actually happened to me. So I'm going, you know, I'm not 100% sure I, if I keep taking my kids' tests like good days. But what if God did that for us? We could get perfect scores all our lives and not know a blessed thing. So daddy doesn't do his children's homework for him. Daddy doesn't take his children's tests for him. So when we pray to God, for God to interfere in cause and effect, that the causes are set in motion, they're going to produce that effect, and we in insert prayer in there and say, God, I know I didn't do my homework. Can you get me an A anyway? God, I know I didn't even show up for the test. Can you make sure I get an A in the class anyway? And sometimes we do that. We are growing children. Often, hopefully, we're adult children somewhere in there seeking the perfect wisdom of a father who wants his children to grow. Who wants his children to be strong. Who wants his children to be courageous. I mean, how often does the Bible say, be strong and courageous? Grow is very simple. Grow just means be better. Whatever you were today, be better tomorrow. Whatever you were yesterday, be better today. Just be better. And it's a jagged line. Oh boy, do I wish that was a straight line, a nice smooth line, that, that every Sunday was better than the Saturday, every Saturday was better than the Friday, every week was better than last week, every month was better than last. It's kind of this jagged line. Kind of looks, I guess, a bit like the stock market. You're kind of, you're kind of doing well, it's kind of working, and then like, okay, you know, correction, you know, boom down, start working your way back up, boom down. And, and over the long arc of time, we get better. Over the long arc of time, we get more mature. But you know, in between, there's some ups, there's some downs, there's some huge forwards where, boy, we can look at that moment and go, we can, we can be really proud of how well we handled something. You know, if I could make that my normal, then I could have that one handled and move on to the next one. Sometimes we can. Eh, sometimes it's just kind of a really good day and tomorrow's not as good. But we just work that jagged level up and, and grow. Be better over the arc of time. Be better. Strong means do hard stuff. Just because it's hard, don't shy away from it. Now, I want to underscore a key point right here on the strong part of being strong and courageous. There's two ways we can be strong. One is your ability to handle stuff that comes your way. Because I don't know if anyone but me has noticed, but sometimes there's some like, hard stuff in life that comes our way. I trust that's not me only. And part of strength is can you handle the stuff life throws at you? Because you have to, right? And you know, Abraham Lincoln had, had said, you know, that difficult. You, if you want to test a man's character, don't see how he goes through hard stuff. Why? Because everyone has to go through hard stuff. You, you have two choices: you either make it or you don't make it. Because you don't have a choice. It's there. It's happening to you. What are you going to do about it? But he talks about, if you really want to test a man's character, give him power. When it's an option and he can do whatever he wants, now what? Well, part of being strong, part of doing hard stuff is, don't just withstand the stuff life throws at you. That is a vital part of strength, because that, that's like live or die. Survive life, don't survive life. Break under the weight of life, or, or don't break under the weight of life. But part of doing hard stuff is moving forward into optional places because it's good. And do that kind of hard stuff. The stuff you can totally get away without doing it, and no, nothing bad's going to happen. I mean, the stuff where you got to do it if bad stuff happens, the bad stuff will motivate you. But when you're pursuing good stuff, are you willing to go do hard stuff to get to the really good stuff? And courageous means do scary stuff. Now you can hopefully pretty obviously see how courage is related to strength. The strength of bearing all things, which is a key part of love, of, of enduring things. You've got to bear the burdens that are yours to bear. You've got to endure the stuff that's happening. 
I mean, what option do you have? Courageous to do the scary stuff. You don't have to. But it's good. And you can. And the scary stuff might be hard, but if you are strong and courageous, you can look at that scary hard thing and go, you know, that would be worth it. I'm not saying it'll be easy. I am saying it'll be worth it. Let's go for it. But is it scary? Yeah, it's scary. You can't have courage without fear. Courage is I feel fear. I'm going anyway. There is no courage without fear. So be better. Do hard stuff. Do scary stuff. Grow, be strong, and courageous. In relationship with our Father. God is king. We also relate to him as our king. He is a ruler. We seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. His right way of doing things. And all these things will be added unto us. Now you can go break out that one verse and look at it in context. And just walk in with this understanding of it and see what you find yourself. Seek first the kingdom of God. God is your king. And his righteousness, his way of doing all the right things. We're not just talking about moral goodness in the sense of he's not doing morally evil things. We're talking about his righteousness as him doing the right things. That agathos goodness of doing good that creates good. Doing good that is of benefit. Doing the right things that produces good results the right way. And all these things, is talking about all your needs, all, all the stuff that you want, that's how you get there. You look at what is the outcome, what is the process to produce that result. And you do the right thing. Now what if there's a right thing that's more, that's right thing is cause and effect right thing, but it's morally wrong. Well then obviously that doesn't qualify as God's right. Do the morally right things that are the cause and effect right things to produce the res good results in a good way. So seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. To whatever extent the resources exist and are available and they can be channeled through your life, you do things that way within the context of moral goodness and that's how you get there with God as your king. And then we serve God as his knights. We are his representatives in this world. He doesn't show up and draw his sword and do stuff himself. That's our job. We are his hands. We are his sword. We are his shield. And it's part of our job to handle things here. Now here gets to be one of the most interesting aspects to us. We put father and king together. Father and king. He is the king of all creation, and he's my father. If our father is king, what does that make us? A prince, princess. We are princess and princesses of heaven. We have rights. I have access to my father, the king. I can enter his court with joy with boldness because he's my father as well as my king because I'm a member of the family but we also represent the throne as well as we can so when I come before God he's my dad because I'm his kid I have access to the king because I am his son when I walk out into the world of the house of God into the world I might be the way we phrase it sometimes I might be the only gospel somebody reads I might be the only Christian that the atheist knows that they can respect as a Christian now by the way this is how critical it is this, this is a couple of moments of me getting it right so there was an event going on where we had three Christian women who were literally trying to tear down everything I was doing, actively going out of the way to sending hundreds of letters out with some of the, these you know, ridiculous accusations. 
and they got some and their contracts canceled and some terrible things were going. They were calling everybody leveling accusations, the people who knew us well enough knew better. The people who didn't go, you know, well, you know, we don't know, it's better to just stay away from it. And the atheist that was attending the dojo at the time said, you know, that's what Christians do. Because to him, that was Christianity. That kind of judgmental, argumentative, we're right, everybody else is wrong, you're bad, and we're going to stop you kind of Christianity. And I asked him a simple question. It's like, well, what do you think about how I'm handling it? He said, well, well, yeah, but you're different. Then which one of us do you think best represents what Christianity is supposed to be about? And yet, good point. And for the rest of the time he lived in San Diego until he moved out of town, he came to our Bible study. Because he wanted to learn the kind of Christianity he was seeing being lived here. By us. Doing this kind of Alathian, Agathian, Guardian style of Christianity. That's us representing our father, the king. That if I am Prince Scott of the creation house of God, I am his ambassador and his knight. And if I am the only Christian somebody sees, what will they think of my Christ? If I am the only servant of God somebody sees, what will they think of my God? So I have attended and been a presenter at a local atheist coalition. And when, when I'm there to be a speaker, that you know, they, they show a decent amount of deference and respect to a speaker. But I've also just been there as a guest, not as a speaker. And when I was introduced, I was introduced as, oh, this is Pastor Scott. He's a Christian, but he's also a logical, reasonable man. So he's one of us. Now think about what that means. Their perception of Christians is they're not logical, they're not reasonable, they reject science, that this is not an intellectual. This is not someone you can have a rational discussion. That's their perception because that's what they're exposed to. That is the, the gospel that they've seen and they've been around because of the Christians they've had contact with. So our job as a son of the Father as a son of the king, as a knight in service to the royal house of God, is to represent my king well. I am a royal knight, and as royal knights, we are members of the royal family, serving our king as knights, as ambassadors, as representatives. And with all of this, Creator, Father, King, uh, we've been talking about the Acts, Prayer, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. We focused on Thanksgiving recently. This is part of adoration. If you go through all 70 ways God is presented, that's adoration. If you are honoring God as your Creator, as your Father, as your King, that's adoration. If you're honoring God as being infinite in His genius, infinite in His wisdom, perfect in his love. That's adoration. As you're honoring God for being omnipresent, omnitemporal, if you're honoring God for being all-powerful, that's part of adoration. And with 750 different aspects to dive into at whatever level you choose to, you could spend time in adoration with God, focus on the ultimate perfect ideal a compass heading to go seeking out. And you could invest it, uh, your time really focused on God and focus on the extent to which you can reflect God back out into the world. The level to which the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is part of, of God, is Trinity. That you can cooperate with the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life as you honor God, as you show your adoration for God and who He is, and say, to what extent can I be a conduit through which, as I agree with the Holy Spirit, as I cooperate with the Holy Spirit, as I align myself with the Almighty, to be a better knight, to be a better ambassador, 
to be a better representative of the Christ I want people to see, of the Father I want people to know, of my Savior I want people to accept, and that the way I live my life as his kid, as his knight, and as a creation of the Almighty will impact the lives around me. In this particular season, anytime you're, you're around a religious holiday, Christmas, Easter, people are more aware, people are more open, people are more open to the discussions. And don't shove it down someone's throat. I've never seen that work. Don't try to argue someone into the kingdom of God. I've never seen that one really work. But answer any questions they have. Live the kind of life, be the kind of person that would prompt them to even have questions in the first place. And as people relate to God as the baby Jesus, as people connect with Christianity, even just as a largely commercial, largely secular celebration, I mean, think about what this means. Is this is a time that people are looking to Jesus. They may be living in the secular manifestations of the holiday. But this is also our chance to be the ambassador. Not necessarily to be the evangelist, but to make sure that our presence in their lives, the places we have, never pushes people away from God, that it only draws people to God. And that if the conversation arises, if they do have a question, that our response to them, our example to them, can draw them even one tiny sliver closer to God, and at the very, very least, never, ever, ever push them further away from God. As befits a creation of God Almighty, as befits a child of the King. Merry Christmas, everyone. Enjoy your holiday holy day and as we as Christians connect with our God our Savior our Lord our Creator, our Father and our King let us be blessed and through that blessing be a blessing to the world around us God bless you and may you bless all those in your life